Quinn Snyder, welcome to the Way of Champions podcast. So excited to have you and Jerry here to talk about all things basketball and life. Thank you, guys. I'm uh, I'm happy to be with you. Been looking forward to this for for a long time. Um, as we uh, as Dr. Jerry and I have have gotten a chance to reconnect, this is this has been a uh, a catalyst for. So from good, some good conversations that, uh, that I've enjoyed over the years. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, maybe we'll start with that. Uh, Jerry asked me to ask you, um, how did you guys meet? Do you remember that? I just wanted to test Quinn on that one. Right. Well, I, you know, I remember the, uh, the significance of, of our, our early meetings because it was, I was really just beginning at Missouri as you know a first-time head coach in college and I I believe it was Danny Ferry that originally uh connected us in 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 not a uh it was more more Danny talking about Jerry and their relationship and and what he had meant to him as he had kind of navigated the the challenges of professional a professional basketball career and and that he had felt like Jerry was someone that that really helped him keep perspective. Um, I don't recall all the details of that conversation, but I remember, you know, it striking me in a way that it was like, well, this sounds this sounds right. And and to be honest, I, I thought about it with respect uh, to our team, but I also thought of it really in a personal way and kind of with the 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 understanding that that if I you know, as a leader, that if I'm in the right place as a head coach, that that is going to project onto my team. And um, we had a few conversations, and I, I think we just kind of jumped right in, Doc. Is that your recollection, too? Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I always uh, like to uh, juice it up a little bit, <clears throat> make it a little bit more, uh, you know, sexy. but uh, More, more well, more, more true, actually. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I think, I think uh, yeah, he was telling you about this book, Thinking Body, Dancing Mind, as I recall. That's correct. That's and you got back correct. to him right away. And you, I mean, you were talking to him right away. And you said, I've got that freaking book right on my desk. You know and what? Uh, you're, you're right. Yep. And and uh, you said, I wonder if he'd come to Duke. Well, you know, you didn't have to twist my arm. Uh, one of my dreams was always, always to uh, show up and see a game uh, at Cameron. That was uh, my, my boyhood dream, and and here it was becoming a reality. It just so happened that the head lacrosse coach had invited me a week earlier to come to Duke, and then then all of a sudden you showed up on the screen and. It was like, oh my God, this is meant to be. And, uh, but I was, it was quite an honor for me uh, to be invited into your domain, uh, given mm-hmm. the, uh, the level of, of talent and athletes. And, uh, you know, that was quite a while ago. That was, we're talking 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and, and we're both a lot younger. And, uh, you know, my profession wasn't as, robust as it is now and your profession wasn't as robust as it is now and so we all went through a lot of learning and what have you but that beginning really gave me a lot of confidence uh having having your affirmation of the work i did was extremely important to me going forward as was danny's danny ferry Mm -hmm. really good friend Mm -hmm. of both of ours and so forth but that was a very fortuitous meeting and here we are 21 years later yeah it's it's uh I remember exactly about the book, the, the, the timing for me. It's, I, I, I remember the impact that you had on me personally, what I took from it really when I got to Missouri. And I do remember you were working with, I think you were working with Maryland's lacrosse team too. Yeah. Point, Maryland. Too. Yeah. I, uh-huh. It's true. Uh-huh. Very true. And, yeah. But what are, anyway, I, it's, uh, it's been, it's been the start of a, of a really good thing. And I think, for me, something that I've used in really in my personal life, our interactions were as much, I think, personal as they were professional. Yeah, I, uh, that's probably the reason I continue to do the work. And John, too, that we do because it's really about life, isn't it? And uh, using basketball is 
beautiful metaphor, a beautiful, beautiful vehicle to really learn, right? Who am I, you know? Well, get on mm-hmm. the basketball court and find out who you are, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Speaking of that, I, I, have a, uh, I have a thought here that I, was, uh, I wanted to run to. Uh, Quinn, I remember when you were coaching at Missouri. Now, for those, those of you who are listening, this is astounding. Uh, after one year in the Big 12 Conference, uh, they had a survey and what they did was they asked all the athletes, all the basketball athletes in the Big 12 Conference, we're talking Kansas, Oklahoma, those kind of teams, Missouri. And they said, who of all the coaches in the conference would you most love to play for? And the overwhelming response was Quinn Snyder. One year, head coach. <laughs> uh, the, the true story, this was a vote of confidence for you as a head coach, but but I claim more of an affirmation of, of how you so early on had mastered the relationship game. You know, we have a ton of coaches and leaders out there who could learn so much from your wisdom, Quinn, about the important yeah. aspect of leadership in terms of, I was in awe of watching you and how you worked with your players, not for the X's and O's, believe me, I wasn't that interested in it. But what you did was especially it was very specific and you won their trust and respect and to have all the athletes, basketball athletes in a big 12. I want to, I want to play for Quinn Snyder. What's that all about? Well, you know what? I, I honestly don't, I don't remember that. And it, it, at the same time, it makes me feel really, really good. Um, and particularly when, when I think you use the word, the word trust. And I think, you know, as a coach, you know, a lot of your interactions um, are instinctive, um, and some of them seem very small. And I, but I think the accumulation of of all those different small interactions, particularly when there's there isn't something that's quote unquote at stake in those moments, really form that foundation. So that when something is more important or more immediate, um, you have you have something to to look at and rely on and intuitively you, you kind of, you do trust each other. So um, it, you mentioned the, the uh, you know, basketball being a metaphor for life. And I, I think that that's, that's one of the things that attracted me to coaching that if I could somehow coach the way that I want to live, you're continually given feedback on that. Um, and particularly through the lens of competition. Hmm. Quinn, you know, I, I think it's, you know, as Jerry said, it's such an interesting thing. I mean, how, how did you come to that place as a coach early on understanding the the relationship side? I mean, maybe talk about some of the influential coaches in, in your life. And, you know, I was fascinated as I was doing the research and getting ready for this um, undergrad degree in philosophy. Um, you have a, a law degree and an MBA. I, there can't be that many professional head coaches out there that can tick all those boxes. So you've been this lifelong learner and, and, and lover of knowledge. Um, but what shaped you as a coach, especially early on there? Cause I, I think a lot of coaches don't recognize the importance of relationships and trust early on. They think it's about the offense and the defense that they're running. Yeah. Well, I think beginning with, with when I played, um, I gravitated to, to Duke because of Coach K and because of the players that were on the team. So for me, it was both the relationship with the coach, which I didn't really, I didn't have a, a box that said, you know, sunny weather, good academics, excellent conference, relationship with coach. It just was something that I felt. Um, and then the same thing happened when I visited Duke, the relationships with the players. And I think those two things uh, really go together because it's really the personality and the identity of the group. And to your point, you know, the, the coach um, in a large degree is, is responsible for that and can impact that more than, more than anyone else. And I got to a point really that I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to play basketball anymore. And it was uh, not that I, you know, the, the game, I wasn't, it didn't have some distaste for it or some, you know, bad experience that drove that. It, it really was the opposite. We had had a successful team and I enjoyed it, but I really, 
I felt like at that point in my life, I wanted to, to redirect. And that's why I chose to go to graduate school because I, I wasn't sure what I, what I wanted to do. And then over the course of, you know, it was four years um, that by the time I got to the end of that process, there was, there was really only, there was one opportunity that I really uh, gravitated towards. And it was a, a fellowship with a group called the Kauffman Foundation. And essentially mm -hmm. it was a fellowship in venture capital and entrepreneurship. And what they, what they had was you would go, they would place you with a venture capital group, you know, some of the top venture capital groups in the, in the country at that point. Um, and then from there, that VC would place you with a portfolio company and you would go there and, and work with that group. So you kind of had this, this learning process and then this on, on the front line, you know, seeing the management of a day-to-day -day company. And I, I drew the parallel in my mind where venture capital was coaching and on, you know, the, the portfolio company, the, the, the startup was the actual plane. Oh, wow. And, and it, it made sense to me that it, it worked that way. Mm -hmm. And that was really brilliant. Yeah. That was the story like through the interview process and it was real. I mean, I, I, I had a chance to, to take, um, had a couple opportunities on wall street that were exciting to me and in finance and, uh, kind of, I ended up getting close on, on some of that and just didn't feel right. And th th I remember really this fellowship was something that was really, really important to me. And I kind of laid it all out there. And there were a lot of people that were more qualified than me. And, but I did get through, you know, the latter stages of the process and, and looking at some of the people that were chosen, they made the right choice. Um, you know, I didn't have, I wasn't credentialed in that way. But I, I remember getting the letter and being, you know, the extremely disappointed. And then over the period of the next, you know, couple of days, I was asking myself, you know, if this is really what I believe, you know, why am I not looking back at, at coaching? Clearly, I'd, I'd finished playing um, or at least, you know, finished playing professionally or, you know, collegiately my, my competitive career. Um, was over um but this is so I, I i wrote up a form letter and um sent it to you know 315 division one schools just hey i'm i'm out here and i'll go come come work for you if, if the opportunity is there and i i borrowed money to go to grad school so i had about two hundred thousand dollars in debt <laughs> and that really that that scared me um because the jobs that I was, you know, looking at were probably, you know, anywhere from fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars on entry level positions. So I was prepared to, you know, to to uh, defer um, or interest only for a while. I didn't really know what that would entail, mm -hmm. um, but this was something I felt like I wanted to do. And then about a month or two later, from making that decision in the spring before school had ended, I hadn't graduated yet. Uh, there was a, a shakeup in the staff at Duke and, you know, I, I, so suddenly, you know, I, and I was really that, that, that job became a real possibility for me and one that I really felt like I was prepared in, not from a coaching standpoint, but I knew coach K and I really knew the program. And so I remember it, it's funny. I was talking to coach K about this just literally in the last week. And I was curious if he would remember um, I got a haircut cause I had long hair and it, not so much that there was anything wrong with long hair, but I had been around the team and, and kind of worked in a little bit as a graduate assistant position, but, but was pretty busy. I couldn't travel cause I had school and I put on a suit and I got a bunch of, you know, I, I created some work product and some ideas that I had, um, essentially like marketing materials for myself. And I drove out to his house and knocked on the door and I got the, the, he, he could recognize that I got a haircut. He obviously saw that I had a suit on. I hadn't worn a suit in a long time. Um, <laughs> and I handed him this stuff and just said, Hey, um, I want the job. And I, I don't know exactly what it is, but you know, I'm ready to pour myself into this. And 
um, over the period. He, he, he really he took a long time. I think he wanted to make sure that I was really all in and that I, I really, more than anything, that I knew what I was getting into. Um, so the, the and, and I think to kind of back to your more specific question, I think over the course of the time I was in grad school, I had a lot of interaction with the current players, whether that be Trajan Langdon, um, Steve Wojciechowski, who's now the head coach at Marquette, um, a number of guys, Cherokee Parks, mm -hmm. um, a number of those guys that were on that team that I really, I felt a level of compassion for them. Um, and that year before I started was a very difficult year at Duke. Um, coach K had had um, back surgery that year and wasn't able to, to finish the season. Um, if you go back, it was the first, I think maybe the last losing season that, that they've had at Duke mm -hmm. you know, in 20 plus years. So I got, I got to start at a time that wasn't, it wasn't easy. You know, we were to the extent maybe you could call it rebuilding. Um, but I saw these players who had committed to come to a program in a school that literally the previous year had been to the final four you know, a couple of years before it won back to back national championships. And I saw and felt, you know, the, the pain, so to speak. Um, and all these guys who really, who in my mind, their identities were tied to the success of the team. And when the team wasn't having the success that everyone anticipated, suddenly you saw these people begin to, to, to feel this like weight and I had felt that in my career um, it, it, for different reasons. I was, you know, I, I don't know what the right word would be. I, I, it was very important to me both to please my coach, um, to play well. And I internalized a lot of those things. I think that was, you know, some of the, you know, the immediate thing that clicked with me, with you, Jerry's, and that Danny had talked to me about, you know, the perspective and, and some of these things we're discussing before about, you know, basketball metaphorically. So when I started, mm -hmm. I knew that that was something that, that I could give. I knew that basketball could be the most important thing and then also at the right time be put in perspective. And um, I, I probably knew it more intuitively than consciously. But when I got into coaching, you know, in a very specific way, I felt like I could help players both get better and work you know, with, with all of everything they had, um, you know, and then also maintain the ability to, to have perspective because I think ultimately that makes you even more successful. And then I had an opportunity later on with Coach Pop in San Antonio um, to, to be a part of that. And even though I was the head coach of the D-League program, I really had the best of both worlds because I got to take from – the things that I was experiencing and learning with the Spurs and then go back to Austin as a head coach and, and see the application. And obviously it was different, but just for me personally, um, and that was a whole different animal too, which I, I think was a really important part for me of my development as a coach at a later stage that, you know, we can talk about that some more later, but, yeah, I know Jerry's um, chomping at the bit here. Um, yeah, but so, I, 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 I want I want to I want to just ask you on that because you know obviously these influences, and I'm curious. You might have zero influence at all from this, but you also spent a year coaching in Moscow, and so going mm -hmm. over working in in Europe, where uh, I'm a I'm a soccer guy. And yeah. the, the coaching education and the rigor that goes in and to being a coach is very, very different over there. I'm wondering what that brought to your coaching um, or maybe brought a lot of things that you're like, Ooh, I don't like this. No, you, it, it was an unbelievable experience. And, you know, I, I think I went for that reason, just tried to keep an open mind to part of it was just the, you know, the thrill of, of being in, particularly in Russia and just a culture that was so, different from one that I knew. And I went with a guy named Ettore Messina, who had, uh, was a, you know, is a famous Hall of Fame coach in the EuroLeague and at this point in Russia at Seska Moscow. And um, it, it, 
uh, there were so many things that I learned and was exposed to, um, both with the club in Russia and then around the EuroLeague. We, we played really all the, the, you know, similar to the, um, the top soccer teams or football, Barcelona, Madrid, you know, Bayern Munich, all, all through uh, Europe. We played all those teams in, in, in the basketball component of those clubs. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was a great learning experience. It's, it's given me more since I left than I could have ever imagined. I was talking to Boyan Bogdanovich, one of our players today, and there's a frame of reference. I, I have a chance to talk to him about Sabona, his team mm. in Croatia that he grew up with. And you just, it was another way to kind of form these, these relationships and links that, you know, like, like almost like learning another language, you're able to converse with someone in a different way on a different level. And so I, it, it was a tremendous experience and, and one that I'm really glad. It was hard to leave. I was with the Lakers and it was hard to leave the NBA because it's such a challenge to get there um, as a coach that, you know, you, you had this anxiety about, you know, am I going to be able to quote unquote make it back? You know, are they going to forget about me? Um, because I knew I probably wasn't going to spend the rest of my career um, coaching in Europe. I had two young kids at that point. Really, my wife, Amy, as much as anyone, the fact that she encouraged me to do it. We had a two-year-old and a newborn. Um, so there was a lot of sacrifice um, on the part of my family. But it, it, it was transformative in a lot of ways. Mm, awesome. Jerry, you're off the leash. Go ahead. No, no, I, you know, I'm, I'm so enjoying this conversation <laughs> and not only that, but uh, things that I don't even know Q about, yeah. about you as much as we've talked over the years. Uh, these are stories that are, that are brand new to me and, uh, and beautiful. And, and they all, they're all emblematic as I listen here. They're all, they, they really confirm what I know about you. Uh, you're a deep thinker, you know, you, you don't just walk out on the court and, run the next play. I mean, you're figuring it all out at the same time. And I think a lot of coaches listening to us today don't realize how much effort really needs to be put into that piece of the game where you're really, you're really connecting with, uh, uh, with, with one player and one player at a time, but all players. And, and to get the breadth of experience that you have and bring that to the game, there are very few people, uh, you know, today in the game, in the NBA, let's just talk about that, that are, are really uh, uh, following that modality. I mean, you talked about Pop, he's one. And, uh, you know, Steve, of course, it, uh, the Warriors, uh, Phil in his day, Jackson. And, and, and now, of course, you know, you get to play against Brad Stevens uh, in this, on this trip. And, 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 and like you, uh, you know, they really understand that the outcome and the results are the byproduct of that connection, of that caring, of that mm. love and respect. And, and it's kind of a selfless, a great coach. All the great coaches are really servants. And when I watched you coach, particularly at Missouri, uh, you were there to serve those guys. And, and they knew it and they felt it. And, 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 and that's what made them go the distance. If coach is going to serve us and he's our servant, I mean, my God. Uh, it was awesome to watch. And, and so I think a lot of these young coaches out there need to know you're not in a position of power to be over people, but you're in a different position of power. Now, I sort of use that as a little segue. Uh, Quinn, uh, what a lot of people might not know about you is your, is your love of music. I mean, I, I know that still goes on. And uh, uh, I, I want to just Think about it. This quote from uh, one of my favorite musicians of all time, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, <laughs> Seattle, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, come on. Gar- Gar- uh, Garfield High School. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, about three miles from where you grew up. Uh, he said, and if I got this quote correctly, I'm not even sure, but I rem- I think I remember it. He said, "When the power of love becomes greater than the love of power, you'll win the relationship game and be the greatest." coach leader that you can be now I paraphrase that last point what he was really saying is that you'll have you, you'll create the best life possible and uh, in a day and age when when so many people are into the love of power what we're talking about is tremendous leadership and guidance and mentorship about the power of love 
In what way uh, do you see that statement as being really relevant to uh, sports, sports cultures today? Well, it, just trying to, to process that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. It was kind of long. No, no, you know? no. It's, 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 uh, it, it's not at all. I, I think, you know, it, it, when, when it's power, I, I, I just immediately think kind of it's about you um, as an individual. And to the extent that, that you feel like you need that in order to lead, I, I think about what, what you need more than power is respect. And with that respect comes the ability to lead. And it's hard to respect someone that, that you feel it's all about them. And, um, but, the, but if the, you like, if you, let me, let me jump in. If you love what you do, I mean, look, yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I, I'm in a locker room with you. And I walk in and I sit in a, in a corner and I'm watching you and, and, and athletes are coming in and out and you're going over, you're putting your arms around them. You're looking at them eye to eye, close up. You're loving these guys. And, and they yes. know they, f they feel that love. And, yeah. and that's very, that's very powerful. So that, mm -hmm. that love factor, I mean, right. it was John, it was John Wooden said that, that the reason for all my success was because I had a lot of love in my coaching and my God, yeah. the, the thing I yeah. loved about love about you is I can see that with the jazz today. I, those guys, yeah. those guys feel your love, man. Yeah. It, I think on some level, Jerry, it, it gets back to those relationships and what fills you up. Absolutely. You know, as a human being and, yeah. you know, to, to the extent that that, you know, manifests itself and, you know, people playing for each other, you know, and that to me is, you know, is where it's really demonstrated is that when you're on the court, and you're doing things for one another, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're mm -hmm. putting the group ahead of yourself. That's, we, we think about that and kind of assume, well, they're, you know, they, they need to play like a team or they need the ability to subordinate your own ego and mm. yourself to a larger group, particularly when I think about it in the NBA, um, uh -huh. it's, that's a hard thing to do. And, and I think, the players that, that are capable of playing that way, um, it, it's, a, it's really a constant, it's a struggle at some times mm -hmm. um, because it's not our nature. And, you know, we, as much as you become better individually, we know that, that the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, when you see teams that, that truly, you know, organically, click as a group that's what's happening you know you have a group that doesn't care who gets the credit that plays for each other and th to me that's that's your love right there mm -hmm. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's that's well that's said. how you feel about your family that's yeah you know yeah. when you can put someone else before yourself and care about them and have compassion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and that's what so that's what makes a team that, right Quinn? yeah like absolutely like yeah. because again the whole world media social media is telling them it's about me get my contract Absolutely. get my money get my likes get my Beautiful. influence and and so as a coach especially at your level like that's a everyday intentional like it's about the team selflessness yeah. all that right I, it's a great point and you know over even if you know those things aren't necessarily going to fill you up and provide you know that kind of emotional growth or whatever that the, the food that you need to, to grow, they're still part of your, your day-to-day -day existence. And um, on some level, those things have to be undone. And to the extent that your individual interaction occurs a certain way, I, I think that's, that, that's what happens. There's, you know, something supplants that. And those are, I, I, I sometimes we'll practice just to, be around each other you know and you see teams do it you know going out to eat mm -hmm. just to, to be around each other and to feel you know the humanity uh, of a team because i i think wow. you know, if you think about a team as its own organism i mean um where it's not you know a true true team is is a thing with a life of itself and obviously all those parts are the players, the coaches. I mean, everybody that's around a team and part of a team 
contributes to the team's identity. We call that culture. Um, everything from Derek Gardinia, who is our director of PR, to Adam Klauke, who's our equipment manager, to Mike Elliott, who's our director of sports performance, to Johnny Bryant, who's an assistant coach. Those are the people that Donovan Mitchell is around every day. Anthony Zamora, who you know cooks their food. Mm. Um, that all of those people, to me, it, it, everybody has to have that, you know, kind of. I don't know if I'd call it a philosophical belief, but an understanding that that that's what's important, and that we all are there to serve each other, literally. And if a player can achieve that too, when they're on the front lines. You know, that's – our jobs are more clear-cut, you know. But for players to do that, I, I think, is is a great sacrifice. And as a coach, if you can demonstrate that and ask that and help them find that, mm -hmm. that's un it's unbelievably rewarding. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just stop. It, do it doesn't just start because people are that way. It starts from the top. And, uh, you know, what the coaches out there need, need to understand, if you're listening to this, is – it's the coach's responsibility to set that theme, to set that culture up, to have those core values, those values of, of trust and respect and selflessness and compassion, as you mentioned, Quinn. And, and when it comes from the coach, you get buy-in. And when you get buy-in, people start to feel the essence of those amazing values. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that's what I see happening to, uh, right before my eyes at Utah. It, it's uh... – it's what we've tried to do. Um, for me personally, one of the most significant things that, that happened was I got fired. And, you know, you could call it – I like to say I got fired as opposed to I resigned. Um, <laughs> they're, they're basically the same thing. But, but getting fired to me was a moment for me to reflect and, and test. And, Jerry, as you know, we had – you know, we, as part of our mission statement, we had core values. And mm -hmm. what, one of the things for me over the period of time that I literally, I was trying to figure out if I wanted to coach anymore. And, yeah. you know, I, I was able to look and see where did I, to the extent that I got away from those core values, whether it be personally or professionally, because again, they're, they're, they're related. Um, that, that, the ability to stay true to those, um, both in your life and then on the court. I don't mm -hmm. think it's mm -hmm. hard to, to separate the two. No, when I got can't. to you, no. you know, yeah, I, we, we didn't publicize that, but it did get out at one point. Um, you know, when people are talking. So when I got to Utah, I, I challenged myself to try to identify the things that I felt like our team needed and that, that would help our team win. And it, it's come up when we have a tough stretch in a season, I, I go back to it. Um, when I was hiring um, a coach, it, really in a promotional sense, I was trying to figure out how I wanted to organize our staff. And it, it's just stared me right in the face that this guy mm, represents mm. everything I want our program to be yeah, about. Like, yeah, yeah. this is so clear cut. So, yeah. Um, anyway, that, that, it's, that's something that's that I what, believe that's, in. That's what family's all about, and that's what we're talking about here. You know, we family is la familia. You know, it's it's shared it's shared values and and the uh, willingness to keep each other honest and uh, accountable and responsible. And uh, I think those are important concepts that uh, our leads, listeners need to be aware of. It's it's not just magical. It doesn't happen like some kind of mystical experience. Uh, sometimes it feels that way, but in, in this case, it, it's absolutely uh, intentional on your part, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think these aren't big sweeping decisions. They're they're tiny little moments mm -hmm. where you're making all these decisions that, that take you somewhere, and you may they may not all reflect what you want them to. But over a period of time, you know, you look at that graph and where you want to go and it can look like a maze at times and then you break through the maze. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, th those things, they're omnipresent, and, you know, and we 
can think of all the little things that you have to decide. It's more than just, do I hire this person? Do I really, do I play this player? You know, does this player represent, is he playing the way that I believe we need to play? Yeah. Um, and all those little things that, that help direct you and staying connected to that. That's the only way that you can continue to follow that. Mm-hmm. Jerry, can I jump in here for a sec? Cause oh, I think please, it, John, go a, right ahead. Yeah. It's a, the, um, Quinn is such a great point and it, it really echoes, you know, when we had uh, Steve Kerr on, he told us that the most important part of becoming the Warriors head coach was this time he spent with Pete Carroll when Pete encouraged him, you know, to figure out what's it going to feel like for your people to come to work every day, right? Mm-hmm. What's it going to feel like every day? What are those, you can call them core values, covenants, whatever you want to call them, right? right. But but these things have to come out and, and these core values, right? You, you talk about a series of tiny decisions, but these big decisions of what do we really value, those are also mm-hmm. things that save you from 10 more decisions every day because nope, if it doesn't... Nope fit right Mm -hmm. Right. yeah so so my question for you is is if you're you know willing to share it like what does it feel like to come to work at the jazz and and what are you guys all about yeah i i i concur with i actually had a chance to spend a little time with coach carroll as well and really have enjoyed you know reading his book and i don't get a chance to read as much as I'd like to anymore. Mm-hmm. I've shared that with you, Jerry. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I need to find more of that balance, but we call them pillars. Um, and I, I would, Interesting. I would, I would like to think that um, when you come to work every day and come to practice that there's, you know, in some days it's harder to find than others, but there's some joy associated with that that process, um, you know, as far as just, if we're talking about, you know, the environment that, um, there's to to me, as as far as you're not always going to feel good about the result the night before. Um, but as a head coach that, you know, some of the best times for me are when, you know, we lose and, or we've lost a couple in a row and everything, that is around you is suddenly kind of like wilting and there's a clarity that comes in those moments that's beautiful and everything drops away and you're able to see the people that are vested in in a truer in in a way that's just different because you're the ones that are that are performing and that are being evaluated and being judged And, and a lot of people are but whatever those narratives are they're they're governed by the wind and our film room we we had fun we put a where we watch tape because that's a lot of things that's where the real heavy dialogue happens a lot of times and we had this big steel iron door that we put on it and i'd like to think of it as like as a bunker as a bomb shelter (laughs) and uh it's a little bit metaphor we also jerry we we were able to we found like 16 historic jazz albums and we put those on the wall because and blue is I one love, of them. What's that? And blue is Miles one Davis, of them. Blue is one of them. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I always, I, I felt like that, you know, although we, we commandeered the, the, the nickname when we came from New Orleans to me, the, the jazz, if, if we can play with the same level of um, individuality, creativity, selflessness, you know, a group performing, making music is, is such a great metaphor for, for a basketball team. Um, mm, beautiful. So that, 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 that place is an example. I hope fosters those things. Um, you know, we, we tried to have it reflected um, in, in literally the physical structure of our, our facility where I wanted to have, natural light because one of the biggest things especially when you come to work in the winter time and it's gray and you've lost there's just this there's this foreboding and there's life is there isn't this incredible lightness of being Mm. um you know there's it's the doldrums and so to have natural light throughout the building um to to feel that in spite of whatever the results are that 
it's okay. You know, it's not easy. Um, but the, the, the values the first, I wanted our team to be obviously unselfish, not just unselfish, but unselfish to the eye. When the, you saw us play, that it would be obvious that we were an unselfish team. Um, I wanted us to have a, a craving, not a craving for competition, you know, a competitive craving where, you know, you, you embrace competition, um, you know, as a vehicle. And it's something that you, you, you know, you want it to, to live in you, to be in your blood, um, you know, and then, then we wanted to be connected and, and that the connectivity to me, I mean, there's so many applications, you know, you, you can, you can just find situations where, but you feel, you know, you feel a team when they're connected. There's, and it's something you have to constantly work for because there's always things that, that pull you apart. And the last thing for us was, and this is something, um, you know, that I know coach Carroll, um, you know, they talk about grit to me. We, we talked about perseverance and, you know, but, but passionate perseverance where similar to the, the competitiveness that, that those that resilience that's required in an NBA season of 82 games, you are going to hit um, those difficult patches. And I guess that's what I would point to when you come to work, you know, even if it's hard to know that you're going to persevere and, and to do so with passion, to not let that dissuade you from living your life that, that way. Hmm. Wonderful. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. cool. Beautiful. Beautiful. Jerry, yeah. anything that you got to jump in yeah. on that or? Uh, no, I think, you know, Quinn, uh, you, you nailed it. And uh, I, I particularly like those, those uh, values of connectedness and, and it takes time and uh, all the great teams are, have that sense of connectedness and you can, it's palpable. You can feel it. If you're watching practice, if you're watching a game, you could feel it. And uh, I'd like to kind of just sort of shift gears here. I know we're coming close yeah. to the end, but we're, uh, we're fine. I can talk to you all day, Jerry. Just don't, uh, don't tell me we're on a podcast and we'll just keep talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It'll be beautifully natural. said. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's the way it needs to be. Uh, and uh, that's true of your coaching too. But anyway, so, uh, you know, I know that you knew Kobe and uh, recently we were all distraught and deeply affected by his loss. And uh, mm -hmm. I also happen to know, uh, sadly, that uh, Quinn, you've had much loss yourself this past six months or so. I think both mm -hmm. your parents uh, passed away and it's never easy. Uh, you're the next one up, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, of all of us, all of us in sports experience loss and it has such a a bad rap, you know, we, we, we experience it regularly. Uh, even if only a, a game is a loss, uh, but whatever, but what, what can you possibly tell us about this? What I consider an ultimate gift of loss in all of life and, and how it makes you particularly uh, a better coach like this past year, having lost your mom and dad and having lost some friends. Uh, can you speak to that please? Yeah, I, I you know, there's, I think for me, um, the, the, the reality, um, that, that life is, is finite, that, that, that there aren't a, a continuous abundance of opportunities that, you know, are infinite. Um, mm -hmm. and that to the, to the extent that, you know, those moments, you know, you, for me with my mom, I was, I was driving in the car the other day with my daughter and, you know, I recently had heard John Denver's country road oh. and, and she had actually sung it in a school kind of musical, little musical production. She's, her name's Annika and she's eight. Mm -hmm. And we were driving and there's an Arby's on the corner where we were, where my wife was actually, she was, she, she told me she was driving, she was going through the Arby's drive through to get the kids something to eat when she heard from my brother that my mom had passed away. And my mom was an unbelievably artistic, generous, spiritual woman. And one of the things that, that we did 
was we always sang in the car and she had a beautiful voice. And at that point it was, you know, AM radio and couldn't hear much of it. So a lot of times the radio wasn't on and I saw the Arby's and I made the association with my mom. And suddenly I, re- I realized I was, I was singing with Annika, you know, mm. country roads, take mm. me home. And uh, oh. just the, the, that filled me with just a, you know, to, to use the word again, you know, an unbelievable amount of love for my mom, for my daughter, for the music, for the moment. And, you know, that the loss, I think, provides you with the ability to appreciate um, those moments that, that you're losing. Yeah. And the understanding that that as difficult as that is to try to, to try to live your life in a way that you're engaged and you're singing those songs. And, oh. you know, we get wrapped up. I think that's one of the things, Jerry, that, that you know, mm. you love uh, and I love about music is that you lose yourself in it. Um, yeah. yeah. And you lose your sense of time and place and you're just connected to that and it takes yeah. you to a place that's, that's a beautiful place. And when you can do that with people, and people you love and have those experiences, they're precious. And do you remember? Do you remember the time in uh, in Missouri when we went out to dinner with a bunch of us? And I, I'm trying to the, think of the song. Yeah, one of the was, Eagles. One the of the song? Eagles song. Uh, Eagles song. Um, was it peaceful, easy feeling? Pe- no? Peaceful, easy feeling. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, we all started. One person started, then a second person started. Before you know it, the whole freaking table. There was 10 of us at the table. And everyone was listening. And you know what? They were listening with joy and love and all of that. Yeah. And uh, your point is so they thought amazing. We were crazy. They thought we were crazy, too. But that's and, and, and they were right. And they were absolutely yeah. right. And, and, uh, but the, the thing is, though, that that moment of connection with your daughter, here's your mother passing. You just found that out, and now you're connecting very deeply with your daughter, and you're, you're bringing the love from your mother into your daughter. That, that's an amazing, amazing story. And may I add this? I can, I can only see that that's the humanness that you bring to your coaching, and that's the humanness, the humanity factor that we all need to bring if we're to be effective leaders. Don't you think that's true? I do. Um, you know, you go back, my dad actually used to talk about having a servant's heart um, mm-hmm. to use that word. And, and that was to him. And he it was actually, he was a teacher, um, but also coached baseball. Um, and I, I, I agree that, that you, you, people feel that. Um, and that's, I guess, to our earlier point about what people feel when they come to work. Um, yeah you yeah. know that if that can be and you know if it's real it, it those aren't things that you can just say they're, they're things no. you do now your daughter will remember that that moment for the rest of her life yeah and and yeah. and when you when you translate that into coaching how many opportunities do we miss and how many do we jump on just to connect at that level knowing the story of uh of someone that walks into the, the court that day and, and you just know something went on in their life and you make the connection on that level and they'll die for you. I mean, they will literally die for you. They'll do anything you ask them to do. Yeah. It, um, those are, if the relationships that you have reached that point, it's really a gratifying experience. I makes me think about something that, you know, there, I remember people asking me about, you know, do you miss college? Like, excuse me, do you miss the relationships? Do you, you know, just Mm -hmm. this kind of assumption that now 18 to 22 is a significant time. And well, you know, going away to college, you know, leaving home, those things are all real. The interesting thing about the NBA now is that a lot of players that are in the league are that, that same age. Mm. And you actually, where you used to have, quote unquote, four years, mm-hmm. you know, when you draft a player, you, you'll 
you'll coach them for at least four years and mm -hmm. sometimes longer. Mm -hmm. So it's really a beautiful thing about this league now that, you know, and, and certainly the fact that I don't think it matters that players are playing. There isn't any lost innocence that someone's being, you know, paid to do a job. Um, mm -hmm. The opportunity to form those relationships and to rely on them and for them to play a significant role in, a, in the growth process is there. So um, I just, I wanted to share that because I feel like I've been blessed here in Utah that I've been able to coach players that, that are accepting of that, that, that want that, um, whether it be conscious or unconscious, that that's mm -hmm. been a real blessing, mm -hmm. a blessing to me about this job and, and the guys I've had a chance to coach. I think the, 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 the satisfaction and the relevance and the gratification that comes from this job is, is directly related to your players and yeah. what they're willing to give you and what you give them. Quinn, Quinn, um, I mean, on, on this note and following, thank you for sharing amazing stories. But I think just like you had that moment, the Arby's moment, right? Every person has those moments in their life. They have that song that brings them back to this incredibly powerful place. And I think a coach's ability to connect with that on an individual level as Jerry said, that helps your athletes, you know, run through a wall for you. Um, how do you go about making all of your athletes feel, you know, valued without necessarily being the most valuable player? You have your best player, you have the 12th guy on your bench who is sitting there scared that maybe this is the last contract they'll ever get. How do you reach them all? I think just people knowing you care and it's hard to, to have that, you know, the larger a group gets, there's just practical limitations on what you, you know, have the ability to, to, uh, to, to understand or know that, that are happening. And it makes me, frankly, I think about my staff and the, one of the things that, that I feel like I've learned that, is even more impactful than I, than I thought as I've grown, you know, older and become more experienced in what I'm doing was just the impact of your staff. And, you know, I mentioned a larger staff with support staff, but really I'm talking right now about the actual assistant coaches and I, I reflected on it and, and, you know, that's where I was. I was an assistant coach for a long time. I was an assistant coach at, and, a lot of different teams in the NBA. Um, and it, it's the people that, that work with you, your staff that represent you, that buy into what we're doing, that, that believe in the same things that have that ident identity, you know, that uh, thought and spirit. Um, th that's, those are the people that are able to help you as a head coach connect with those players because you're able to, to be given the awareness and the focus when, because there's certain things that, that a head coach, only a head coach can do on some level. Um, and there's other things that a head coach can't do. You can't do all of them. And to have a staff and a brother um, that, that's able to do that in your stead, on your behalf, probably better than you in many circumstances, but then also have the awareness to, to give you the opportunities to see things and, and see them through their eyes and make an impact. Because I don't think it's something you can do. You, you can be equally sincere in all those situations, but to be able to be aware of them all, I just, I, I think anyone who's doing a good job coaching um, and doing some of the things we're talking about has people that are that are doing a better job than they are on their behalf with the players. And, and to me, it's there's just a tremendous amount of gratitude for your, your staff and your assistant coaches. Mm -hmm. Awesome.
Brilliant. Jerry, um, any, anything else, anything else that you wanted to ask Quinn? We want to be respectful of your time, Quinn, yeah. getting ready to Thank play you. the Celtics here. Jerry, anything? Well, I think he answered, Quinn, you answered my one question at the end here. Uh, you found that the road to Wall Street was really the road to the final four. <laughs> and, yeah. and, 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 and I love how you brilliantly compared the mission had you followed through with Wall Street and how you just channeled that into something like basketball. And now I know the answer. The question that I was going to ask you was, if you didn't find basketball as a profession, what would you have been? Uh, and the answer to that is anything I wanted to be. <laughs> and uh, clearly, you have such a breadth and a, a wide vision. You brought an amazing vision to Missouri when you went there as a, as a new head coach. It was insane. Uh, no one believed it could be done. And what, in three years, you were in the – one game away, one half away from a final four. Uh, yeah. All of these things uh, that, that you talk about uh, are brilliant. And, and, and I really do believe that, uh, you know, with your, with your energy and your chi, that uh, no matter what you choose, you'll be successful at. Uh, and I don't mean the outcome and results. I mean, just the whole process involved. And uh, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I come away from this uh, very inspired, very, more knowledgeable and and i've got to learn so much more about you quinn and uh i'm so happy for you and and your family amy and and the girls and 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 being in utah i mean uh and and oh yeah i didn't put together the idea that that the name this is the jazz yeah and right. uh, how much how much i learned from you in terms of jazz <laughs> and the conversations conversations we would have when we were at a uh, a restaurant like Nana's in, uh, in, uh, at Duke, you know, that's a great restaurant. That's <laughs> a great, I'm glad you read that restaurant has a piece of our, our, our piece of us there still yeah. sitting yeah. at the bar, whether it's in a martini or a steak, either one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now that you, uh, you interrupt. Yeah. no, no, but that, that listen, why do I remember the name of one restaurant? with one team out of a hundred teams I've worked with, you know, it wasn't the so, more uh, team it, your steak. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. I, I was intoxicated with your dialogue and uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, we had some great times there. I really, really, I'm so thankful and honored to be a part of this uh, conversation today. Mm. Well, yeah. As am I. I, I, let's continue it. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Well, Quinn, I mean, my goodness, for the, this being my first conversation with you and Jerry has spoken so highly of you since I've known him. Um, I mean, philosopher, deep thinker, authentic person. I, I think if our listeners get nothing uh, out of this, except this, that your, your depth as a coach, your ability to connect really is directly related to your depth as a human being. And you just laid all that out for us. So thank you so much, so much for being on the way of champions. Thanks guys. I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to have the opportunity and really have enjoyed it too, which is, which is fun. Awesome.